What's up, the Generate Nation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast. This is the NCAA tournament betting preview, round one, part two. Today, we are going to talk about the East and the Midwest regions. Of course, I'm Stucky, and joining me to talk about the East to kick things off, Matty Cox of the Three Man Weave is one of his partners in crime. Kai McEwen will join me in a bit. Matt, how goes it? Where's the excitement level? Christmas is almost here. Good. I'm, uh, well, timing-wise, we're about to watch Indiana kick off their first of many consecutive wins in what should be an improbable but majestic run to the uh, the promised land. Should be a pseudo-home game there in, uh, in Wyoming. I'm sorry, in Dayton. Against Wyoming, I should say. Yeah, the... Uh... The Indiana Hoosiers, uh, I think that they uh, they they deserve to get in, and I'm glad they did for their fans. It's been quite some time, so I'm looking forward to that one. I'm looking forward to discussing the East region with you. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's just dive right in. Baylor, top overall seed in the East. They'll be playing their first two games in Fort Worth, so you think they would have a little bit of a home contingent. Two seed, Kentucky. Pretty loaded region at the top. You know, you have uh, the three seed is Purdue. Like before, you know, maybe about a month ago, month, two months ago, you could have said maybe Kentucky gets to the one line. Maybe Purdue right. gets to the one line. Um, you know, then you have UCLA, team with a final four on the four line. A super tough, difficult, well-coached team in St. Mary's is the five. So you have Texas, the six. I think they were a top five team preseason. You go on and on. It's a pretty loaded region. Does anyone touch Baylor? Uh, before the Elite Eight, who do you have coming out of this bracket? What are your thoughts on the region as a whole? We'll start high level and start di- diving into some of these games. Yeah, I think a legit case can be made. This is the toughest region, um, especially from the the one through eight seed lines. Uh, I, I like a lot of chalk, to be honest, not to spoil our takes as we go through game by game here, but there's a, a lot of favorites I think match up well with um, you know, I, I look at Purdue Yale, for example, I, I know you're big on the Akron potential live dog spot against UCLA, uh, Kentucky, St. Peter's I'm looking at Kentucky to come out of this region. I don't feel great about it. Um, I still believe in Baylor. I worry about that roster with basically six and a half guys at this point. Um, still not fully healthy, especially with St. Mary's lurking as a, in a potential elite eight matchup. But I also worry that everyone and their mother is on the whole St. Mary's thing. And we've gone too far with this love. Um, also worried about that as well, but no, it's, it's a stout region. I mean, I can see upwards of five, six teams coming out of here. Yeah. I ultimately have Kentucky, uh, coming out as well. I look Baylor's banged up now, not fully healthy. Whereas Kentucky, I think that they getting healthy full strength, potentially they could be the best team in the country and their metrics are kind of underweighted a bit because in a lot of their biggest games of the year, right. Early, you know, early in sec play, they either suffered injuries during the game to key yeah. players or had at key, key times out. too. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's kind of, and their metrics are still outstanding, but I think um, with their guard play with big O the cheat code in the middle, like even if you're having an off shooting night, he's going to keep you in it. Um, I think that Kentucky is the best team in this region. I have them coming out, but let's, uh, let's dive in to the individual games, try to find some value and go from there. We'll start at the top Baylor, Norfolk state, Game one in Fort Worth, Norfolk State, Joe Bryant, really good player on the perimeter for Norfolk State. They're going to run that floppy zone out. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, they're going to, Baylor's probably going to get a lot of three point looks here. Is there too much size for Baylor? Turnover issues could be a problem for Norfolk State against Baylor. Does Baylor come out here and like make a statement after? Uh, it, interesting enough, I should note this: no team since 1985 was lost in before the semifinals of their um, conference tournament has won the national championship. And Baylor would be one of those teams. But does Baylor just come out and smoke Norfolk State here? 21 point favorites, or is the line a bit too high? What are your thoughts here? Yeah, I look at this matchup, and I I think Baylor is going to smash Norfolk State. They're going to pick the Robert Jones myriad of zone press games to shreds. However, I worry about Baylor's lack of depth, being able to keep their foot on the gas pedal for a full 40 minutes at that furious pace that you need. I like what my colleague Jim said earlier. Um, I think first half's a better 
play. You, you basically take away that second half, maybe foot off the gas that Baylor um, could be prone to doing. And you're thinking from Scott Drew's perspective, right? He's got to win six games. I have six and a half players. Why am I going to roll out, you know, Flagler and, and, and Meyer going balls to the wall for four, for a full 40 minutes? That said, I think the matchup is definitely in Baylor's favor. I would not be looking to back Norfolk State in a cute dog spot here. Yeah, I agree. Not one of the uh, a 16 seed that I think has a, a enough firepower or matchup advantages. So Baylor should walk through easily. We won't spend too much time on the 116 game. The next game, a little more intriguing, and we'll we'll talk after this individual game. If you think the winner, whoever you think is going to win this game, has yeah. a shot at taking up Albert. North Carolina, Marquette. North Carolina coming out of the ACC, really inconsistent team. Like you can see there at their peak when they're playing really well and everything, you know, their guards are hitting shots. You have Baycott who's tremendous inside. It might be a really big problem for Marquette. The boards might be a problem for Marquette, but you know, North Carolina just they look great one day and not the next. You see, you see what they did at Duke and you see what they did against Virginia Tech. He's all in lose at home to Boston college, but Marquette really faded down the stretch can they? Can their pressure have success here? Is this line too high? Have we oversold Marquette? Who do you think comes out of this eight-nine matchup between North Carolina and Marquette? North Carolina three and a half point favorite here. Pretty high over/under game should be played. I think uh, with some pace. Yeah, I flip flopped on this uh, probably ten times. I, I think if North Carolina does get past Marquette, they're the better, the bigger threat to Baylor and the potential eight over one upset, but I think I'm taking Marquette here um, outright and with the points or catching a field goal. Now it does feel like this game plays close to pick them. We've mentioned the Shaka as a dog angle. Um, the, the, the thing to worry about or to think about with North Carolina, it's like, was that Virginia tech ACC tournament final loss, a blip on the radar, or was there, or was that more indicative of their erratic nature, right? Because you just look at the what six games prior, they were dominant. And I think the narrative was starting to be like, oh, here comes the UNC. We thought we were going to see preseason. Maybe they've ironed out some of the defensive issues. Um, and I think Armando Baycott continues to emerge as a monster threat. And you mentioned the rebounding issues for Marquette, dead last in the Big East on both ends on the glass on a per possession basis. They are physical and they're tough, but they're just not that big. And I know the knock on UNC is that they're soft but they are pretty tall and they are long and they can still get to the glass. And that's where I think Baycott could have a field day. Yeah, I agree. I think the rebounding prowess is, is kind of the, the ends up being the difference black on Lewis, I think is a, a good matchup for Carolina to kind I, of contain him. Right. Yep. I agree. Yeah. I think North Carolina really tough team to trust. So like, if you want to, the problem is like picking the eight, nine here, this is a problem. A lot of eight nines, like the trust count on to get through. And, you know, if you're going to pick them to upset Baylor and then they don't get through, then uh, there goes your bracket. Then you're just a really big Marquette fan. But if we assume I – mean, we can talk about both teams getting through, but which one do you think has a better chance of beating Baylor? If you think it's Carolina, you know, can they, uh, can they upset the one here? Yeah, I think they can. That's I, mean, I end up taking Baylor because you mentioned I just don't really trust UNC to get out of round one. Um, but if they do, I, I look pretty hard at Ben UNC against Baylor in that, in that second uh, – at the end of the weekend spot, I guess another good match to mention here is Daryl Mor Daryl Morcel, excuse me, as a ball hawk to shut down Caleb Love. Um, you have to contain UNC's guards, especially in transition, and Morcel is a glove at the point of attack. So another, I guess, matchup personnel yeah. angle in Marquette's favor. Again, I flip plop back and forth. I ultimately took Marquette plus three, but do not feel great about it. Chalk is a dog. Can't hate it. Can't um, hate it. Feels like it'll be close. All right, let's move down to the games in Portland on the bottom half of this pod, starting off with St. Mary's, their five seed, just a well-coached veteran team, just suffocates you on defense, run great offense. They're going to be taking on the winner of Wyoming and Indiana, which is coming up here shortly before we record. So we don't know who they're going to play. But when I first looked at this, I said, man, you know, Indiana really wants to score inside Wyoming, the heaviest post offense in the country. You can't really get much inside against St. Mary's. They really forced you into tough shots, man. Uh, so I was like, this is a bad matchup. It's going to be you know, short rest as well with some travel involved. So I have St. Mary's moving on. Um, it's not a, it's probably, it's depending on the spread. It's not a team in a matchup that I would love to like lay points with most likely. Uh, what are your thoughts on either one of those potential matchups? Yeah, it's, I think they're all three quite similar. 
um, all, all three very post centric, post up centric offenses. There's actually an uh, analysis by Synergy Sports that came out a couple months ago, and it talked about how St. Mary's and Wyoming are two of the top, I think, four most post reliant offenses in the country, whether it be points via the post up directly or through kickouts and subsequent actions. Then Indiana, as the third banana in this little tripod, is basically, I mean, everyone knows that's where their strength is. The best interior defense in the Big Ten on a adjusted efficiency basis, Race Thompson, TJD up front. Um, it, it's all three teams, like I said, looking in the mirror. I just trust St. Mary's more. I think I'm going to look to back them if Indiana wins. I think we'll get a better price against Indiana. Against Wyoming, they may be laying a little bit too much for me. Um, but I think they advance. I feel pretty safe about both matchups. Tommy Cousy's the X factor, right? I just don't think either team can contain him in ball screen. He looks like Steve Nash the last few weeks. Um, I mean, if he can carve up Gonzaga, um, I've watched Indiana guard ball screens this year. It's not exactly pretty. And Wyoming, Wyoming has some personal limitations defensively on the perimeter as well. So yeah, I love St. Mary's to get out of this. They, if St. Mary's does, and I agree, I have St. Mary's moving on as well. They will take on the winner of UCLA Acker. I think we disagree on this game. I mean, I, I Acker could lose by 30 if the threes aren't falling, but it's gonna be a slow paced game, really slow paced. I think Akron has the bodies inside. Uh, you know, UCLA is the anti analytics team, like uh, they, they're, they're outside the top 300 rim rate, outside the top 300 three point rate. You would think that'd be bad for them, but they that's they thrive in the mid range. Um, so UCLA, I, I think getting healthy at the right time, yeah, but I think in a, in a really slow game, like I. I could see Akron, if Akron's hitting the threes, they shoot a lot of threes, make a lot of threes. And that UCLA on the catch and shoot three, like they're, perim- they're ver- very perimeter defense, still a, a little vulnerable at times. So I actually think Akron is live here. I like Akron plus 14 out of 15, but you disagree. You think UCLA is going to come out here and make a statement? So I thought that I flip flopped here again. Um, it, it's one of those situations where I worry. I was just disrespecting Akron because I was mad they got in the field. I wanted to see another more fun Mac team. Um, but you're right. Look at the matchups, the wing length that Akron boasts against what UCLA has become their new identity, right? It's not like a too big upfront brute old Cincinnati McCronin team. It's more of a wing laden type of team, which I think is better suited for Akron to defend. Um, and you're right in a slow paced methodical game. There's a lot of parallels to, for me with the Montana state, Texas tech game, low total, ugly game. You're catching basically a, you know, two touchdowns, everything does scream dog. If Mick Cronin smart hold zone Akron, the two times this year, Akron saw zone against central Michigan, who was terrible. They actually had like a lot of issues. I don't know if he'll do that. It might be too cute for a round one matchup, but uh, something to keep an eye on as Mick, if Mick Cronin tries to, if this game gets close, I guess, I, I think you might see some of that. All right. I might have, you know, cause I think I'm going to have St. Mary's going to the sweet 16. Yep. I do so- as well. That that's that's one of the reasons why I'm going to pick Akron here in my bracket, like because it's uh, I'm going to have St. Mary's winning anyway. Right. Um, so that's that, that's what I like to do with some of these. You know, a lot of these teams that pull up a big upset, they're not their their run is not going to be long. Um, so, but let's assume it is UCLA St. Mary's and the chalk holds. How do you see that one playing out? Um, you you're, you're agreeing with me? You think St. Mary's gets it done? Maybe UCLA can just live in the mid range because that's what St. Mary's wants to. Play. Yeah, and I think. Exactly. I think they're, I think that's actually, I mean, an overplay for me. I think they're both teams can score at a pretty efficient clip. Um, pace wise, I, I probably going to play to a crawl. St. Mary's always wins the, the tempo tug of war, but you're right. I mean, I think the mid range concerns of the UCLA has just been debunked Like people want to use that as like a, a knock on them, but they have multiple big time shot makers. Um, what we've seen from Bernard and Hakez while Juzang was kind of nursing that injury, it was almost like a blessing in disguise. Like they got two more complimentary scores to now bring to bear with a fully healthy uh, Juzang. It's starting to look scarily like the team that we saw make that big run last year. Yeah, that could could be the case. It's pretty crazy. They went, they could have lost in the first four game last year. It's crazy how things change. And then they went to the final four. Um, and then they come into the season as a top, ranked to the top five. Um, and then they end up safely in as the four seed. So a, a, a big roller coaster of changes uh, in UCLA over the past year. But it's a, a team that's it's certainly a threat. But uh, St. Mary's is just a, a toothache to play. Um, and I think that Randy Bennett is, uh, has this team prime to make a run. Um, all right, bottom half of the East. Let's go to the bottom pods where Kentucky is the two seed. They'll be playing in Indianapolis. So you can expect all blue in yeah. 
in the stadium there. Uh, be an enormous Kentucky contention. But let's start up top in Milwaukee. Texas taking on Virginia Tech. This game's right around a pick. I keep going back and forth on this one. I love Virginia Tech. They got they cast my ACC future for me. It's a team that was loved by the analytics all year. Finally put it all together. Run great offense. Um, one of the things that does concern me a bit about Texas is that they can, you know, pressure you a little bit, pressure the guards of, of Vatek. And the, the turnover issues don't jump off the page on Vatek overall, but they play, uh, they play a, a, a decent amount of teams that aren't going to force you into turnovers. But when their guards can get pressured, they're a little, they're a bit vulnerable there. Yep. The Texas offense is just hard. When you watch Texas offense, you're like, it's just hard to trust. Um, I keep going back and forth in this game. Do you have a strong pick? No, I ultimately took Virginia Tech, but I, uh, it seems like I'll be on the popular side of the coin with this one, just because I think everyone's starting to sour on Texas. You mentioned how VT might be overrated by the analytics. I think this is a great first round matchup against a Texas team that also is debatably overrated by the numbers um, you watch this team play the eye test just does not add up with the on paper resume in my opinion now I think that also leads us to maybe undervalue some things that Texas does well that just aren't that sexy right I think they take care of the ball for the most part they they supplement on the offensive glass um, you know they they don't really turn I mean they're it's a sound team um, outside of running poetic really harmonious offense which certainly has not been the case like that's sort of gone out the window at this point it's basically Let's try and run some motion, get open looks. Our shooters are bad. Maybe Timmy Allen can score against a good matchup up front. Maybe Marcus Carr can bail us out. But it's very much my turn, your turn. Um, that said, Marcus Carr is a pretty good bailout card. So if he's on in this game, if Timmy Allen can maybe get going inside, although I think Mutz is a great counter matchup for him defensively. You're right. Another one where I go back and forth, back and forth. Ultimately, I just took VT. I'm, I'm, I'm signing with the Hokies here. Um, just trust Mike Young. I think this team's on a roll. I'm, I don't want to get in the way of this team. So I'm on Vatek. One wild card. Texas defense is obviously excellent, coached by Beard. No middle. One wild card here with the Big 12. Like I watched Oklahoma today, and their offense it just looked like it was just breathing. And, like, they got out of the Big 12, and they got out of those no middle defenses. There's incredible defensive coaches. There's incredible defenses. Uh, like, even Iowa State, who can't throw a ball in the ocean. They have a great defense. Texas Tech, Kansas. Uh, yep, exactly. Baylor, right. Yeah, I mean, it's just across the board, and you have a lot of these similar no middle defenses and they're all well schooled long switchable so like does Texas, get out of that so, like yeah. dungeon you're right i'll dig to the big 12 offenses sort of exhale that's a good point i yeah. like that actually so we'll see if that is the case i'm still going back and forth on that one not a big decision for me because i don't think either one of those teams is going to beat purdue although purdue has weaknesses i don't think purdue is a legit national title contender and um, their offense is excellent arguably the best in the country outside of a few turnover issues that can creep up, but their defense is major issues. Um, you look back on Kempom, historically before the tournament, you pretty much, you add up your offensive and defensive adjusted efficiency. You can't be over 50. Um, if when you add those two things up, then your offense has to be in, you know, pretty much in the top 25, which is the case for Purdue. I think they're mm, one or two, but the defense is on the perimeter. They don't force turnovers. They struggle with guard pick and roll, struggle with quicker guards. Their defense is number 100. There's only been like one or two exceptions and the teams are like 55 and they have like a star just takes over right. doing that in, in Ivy. So, Yale, a guard named Swain, if you haven't seen him play, I'm sure most of you might not have. He's an incredible shot maker. He can maybe his speed and they can be able to have some success. In the perimeter, but there's only so much one man can do. I think this is Purdue's game. I think Purdue blows them out. Yep. Um, and I think Purdue goes to the sweet 16. I think Purdue also will be focused here. They got upset in the first round last year against North Texas. This is a much easier test for them. I think Yale is like the, and I think Princeton or Penn would have been a, a more interesting option in the first round. So Swain might go nuts here um, to keep Yale in it for a bit, but I think Purdue's bigs too much, too, too many advantages. And then the rebounding, they should dominate. So I think Purdue rolls here. I'm laying it and uh, I have them advancing to the Sweet 16 in Milwaukee. Um, I have a decent fan base there. Yeah, I'm with you. I have a pretty chalky bracket in general, but definitely chalky here. Um, Purdue advancing to Sweet 16. I think they demolished DL. You know, the, the bigs just have no shot up front for the Bulldogs. I think Yale's only hope for success is if, if Swain goes bananas. However, I think Painter's going to put Ivy on him 
um, and eliminate a lot of that risk of him having a repeat heroic performance that we saw in the Ivy championship. The other route for Yale to maybe compete is with ball pressure. Their guards are actually pretty athletic, like for as much size as they lack up front, they do have a pretty athletic backcourt. Um, that really like gives them a huge edge in the Ivy and actually could give them an edge in this matchup. If, you know, given we just saw Purdue cough up the rock against Iowa's pressure, I know Iowa's pressure has turned into a different animal. I'm not saying Yale can replicate that, but James Jones is a smart coach. He's probably looking at that game and thinking, Hmm, you know, I need to do something sort of gimmicky to, to try and flip the odds in my favor. Yeah. So I you can see something really quirky coming out of James Jones bag of tricks, some sort of pressure inducing thing to make guys not named Jaden Ivy handle the ball. But again, that's a reach. I think Yale wins by 25, 30 easily. All right, let's move on to the bottom half of the entire East. Uh, the last pod, in this case, we played in Indianapolis, Murray State. You would think they their fans travel extremely well for the OVC conference tournament. So you're going you're getting a pretty good uh, contingent of Murray State fans here in Indianapolis, along with Kentucky fans. Bluegrass State will be well represented. They'll take on San Francisco. Really disappointed in this matchup. We're taking out two really good mid majors that had a potential to make a run. Murray State is excellent. They ran through the OVC. They haven't lost since Auburn. Um, they have a very dynamic duo in KJ Williams, Tevin Brown. Uh, San Francisco, great guards as well. Major question here. Their big is potentially him. To, and they say he's going to play, but that could be, uh, you know, that's one of the strengths of San Francisco. They really strengthen their their front line, but maybe they're not at full strength. Um, I keep going back and forth on this one a million times. Um, yep. <laughs> any any clarity you can offer? No, I. the more I've thought about it, I'm sort of trying to take the devil's advocate view against Murray State. Um, like the more I think about it, I look at their season this year and also a little bit last year. Um, not that that's completely relevant, but two of their, I mean, KJ Williams and Tevin Brown, I mean, well, some of the core is still back and that team was somewhat of an unmitigated disaster last season. Now they're at a different level, obviously helped by the transfer portal. Um, you look at what they've done this year. I think they got people's attention because they beat Memphis. And by the way, they beat Memphis at a time when Memphis was in disarray and they made every shot under the sun that game. Then they ran through a historically bad OVC team or OVC, yeah, Belmont sorry, OVC team, league. This is not the Belmont, not though, the same every year. And the matchups they had issues with, with what? Moorhead, right? Like a team that can actually match their size and pleasures. And they still took care of business all three times. Give them credit for that. But the more you look at it, the more I think this team's maybe not as invincible as I was initially thinking. And I know that Todd Golden and the USF staff is going to have something cooked up um, to attack whatever matchup edge that pops on tape. I haven't found that edge. Um, so a lot of things now that I've thought more about it are pointing toward USF. But you mentioned off the top there. Um, without knowing Masalski's status, I can't back it because he's so important to what what they do uh, on both ends, just like that physical presence up front. He is critical in a matchup against KJ Williams, who can dominate if he's out potentially. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when you look at the schedule, I kind of like that. I mean, they beat Chattanooga at home uh, early in the year. They went on a run late. I mean, the game was tied with 10 to go. They had some good three-point variants that game. Um, they, they've done a lot of the late-game runs. I mean, they have some spurt ability, as, uh, as Mosman likes to say, which, again, I don't want to take credit away from them, but I think it's relevant context. Yeah, Chattanooga got in on a, a prayer three-pointer. The only other well, – I mean, I really like Chattanooga, but their only other win over a tournament team was when Memphis was in disarray. So, yeah, the schedule was certainly favorable. Uh, so maybe I like, I like that angle. I'm trusting the San Francisco coaching staff. Uh, to get it done, because I, I was going back and forth there. Kentucky, St. Peter's, the last game we'll talk about in the East. Kentucky out to 17 and a half, 18 point favorites. St. Peter's, surprise team came out of the next. Many people, including myself, thought it was going to be Iona. They've been a covering machine. Yes, they have. 17 and four, 17 and four, I think, against the 17, four and two against the spread or something like that in 2022. Their defense is incredible. They'll pressure you. The top five press rate of all tourney fields. They'll extend their pressure because they have one of the best rim defenders in the defo in the country. And he's not like a seven footer, but he is really strong at the rim. Their offense, a lot to be desired there. Uh, you know, when I look at their, their offense, I need to live on the offensive glass. I need to get to the line. Kentucky doesn't really foul and they're going to do well on the boards. Kentucky ranks in the ninth percentile against the press, but it's only about a hundred possessions. And we mentioned 
some of their injuries to their guards when they're playing like LSU or other teams. Right. I think that's skewing that stat, but can Peters do enough to stay with inside this number? I don't, I think the talent gap is too big. Yeah. And big O is just a, a different step up in class uh, inside for that Peters interior, but can Peters stay within this number or do you think this is a Kentucky statement game? Um, what say you? Yeah, I'm on Kentucky. I don't feel as confident as I do in the Purdue Yale uh, favorite, large favorite route here, but I do think Kentucky gets over the number. St. Peter's can be more of a thorn in the side just in how they play. They're going to play slow on, on offense. And I think they have a lot of length and can havoc and just disrupt you defensively. However, Kentucky could shoot what 40 free throws in this game, like realistically. So if they're making free throws, they could kind of, this could be a death by a thousand paper cuts sort of cover. If you're back in big blue nation, um, I look at St. Peter's run. You mentioned the cover streak that they just went on through the end of second half of the season. They had a lot of fortuitous shooting luck, best three point shooting team in the Mac. And then the best, uh, opponent three point shooting percentage. They don't really, I guess both of those numbers feel a little bit fluky to me. Um, I know they don't shoot a lot of three, so it's a low volume number, but I think there's a little bit of fortune in that ATS surge, so to speak. I think their interior defense is for real, but some of that outside shooting disparity is a little bit, uh, precarious, I guess. Do you have one team in Mary? So we're assuming if Kentucky moves on, now it is a set of a semi high number for such a, a low total. Uh, but you make a yeah, good point about right. the free throws and I mean, and, and Kentucky doesn't shoot a lot of threes. I think that they're the least three point line team in the field, um, which could help you if you're on the dog. Uh, but the, the talent gap is pretty big here. But so we'll assume Kentucky moves on um, very bold of us, but do you have one team? I mean, you could get an all Kentucky matchup against Mary state or against San Francisco two really talented and pesky mid majors. Would you give one of them a better chance at upsetting Kentucky? Can you see one of them taking them down? I think Murray is the better shot just in, on a pure Jimmy's and Joe's personnel basis. Right. Um, I, I think that's what held them. Like obviously the shot making in the Memphis game was a big reason they won. And uh, again, we talked about how that was at a different time in Memphis's storyline, but that's, I think the recipe for success and why I think Murray can go up against anyone in the country and not be outclassed because they have that top shelf length speed at, at all five positions. So, yeah, I, I give Murray a really good chance to win that game. I'll probably take Kentucky. I'm really curious to see what that spread comes out. Right? I think we see another uh, – we made this comparison before, like the 2018 Wofford second-round game where it's, what, a five-point spread? Four and a half, yeah. Four and a half, right? And it's going to be something – I don't know it'll be that low. Um, it's going to be pretty – it's going to be, what, less than a touchdown probably, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe six, six and a half. Yeah. Uh, depending on how – it's like if it's Murray State, depending on how they look in the first round. Um, yeah, I remember I was on – I was rooting for Kentucky when I was in Vegas and I had Wofford and um, what's his Fletcher name? Every, just couldn't miss, couldn't every make a shot. Three. Yeah. Couldn't and make I couldn't a get damn that shot. last one to fall for the cover. Um, but tough way for his season to end. Um, and then if we assume it's chalk in the bottom, which we do ultimately from a bracket perspective, Kentucky, Purdue. Now there's going to be variants in this game in that big on big crime here. They just incredible bigs. Shibway you know, Purdue as a pair, like who's, is there foul trouble? And it's one of the things I worry about Kentucky because coach Cowan was conservative in the country with benching guys of two fouls in the first half. So something like she would get some two, you could get in foul trouble early and then he's sitting. And then all of a sudden Purdue has that edge inside. I think the difference though, what happens there is that Purdue perimeter defense. Um, burns yeah. them and Purdue's yep. guards take uh, Kentucky's guards, take advantage. They advance. And I think ultimately they advance to the final four. Would you agree? Yeah, there's too many angles that Kentucky can come at you from, right? Severe Wheeler, Ty Ty Washington, and then Grady um, as the sniper on the outside. Too many weapons there, along with your big O uh, safety valve up front, just cleaning up everything. Yeah, Kentucky, I think, beats Purdue. All right, so final four team. Well, let me, before I let you go, who, if you have finalized it yet, um, have you finalized your bracket? Who's your final four? Most importantly, who do you have coming out of the East? And then who do you have winning it all? Yeah, it's like my version eight. So I have the uh, the, the caveat in case I change it so by tomorrow to morning. Change. Subject to change. Thank you. You have to put that caveat in there. Currently have very heavy chalk. I took Gonzaga, Gonzaga Light, a.k.a. Tommy Lloyd and the Arizona Wildcats. So two top one seeds there. Uh, I'm taking Kansas, the other, the third one seed in that Downey Soft Midwest region. And I'm taking UK, Big Blue Nation, too to squeak out of the East, which again, I still think is the toughest um, 
just from the depth of the top end teams in that that region, one through six, seven, just really good. Ooh, that would be an incredible final four. Yeah, it would be. Uh, and your CBS champion? would be happy. Yeah. Uh, I'm taking the Zags. I think I've taken them, what, like four of the last eight years or something. So obviously it's never come to fruition, but you look at their expected, how far they've gone relative to expectations. They've actually been pretty good in the tournament. I mean, what, two championship losses, yeah. not, a, not a lot to scoff at. So yeah, zigzags for me. What about you? You do. Uh, I have Gonzaga, Arizona, Kentucky, and uh, we're about to talk about the Midwest here, um, but I don't have either of the top two seats, but you have to tune in. And I'll, ah, I'll great tease. Uh, tease. But I have Kentucky winning it all. Um, I always, with my bracket, it was my original preseason future. I thought by the time March rolled around, they'd be a top five team. They were a top five team earlier than I thought, and now they're fully healthy. Um, and uh, the region is tough, but I like some of their matchups. Like they just got to avoid that scare in that, that second game. Like that could be scary, but I like their matchup against Purdue. Um, I think they can get by Baylor if they come out of the uh, out of top or UCLA. So I, I think that their path, even though the East is loaded, um, I think that their, their path to the final four is reasonable. And I think they're the best team. And I'm just sticking with my guns from the preseason. So I have Kentucky winning it all. Um, and I have them playing. Well, I won't. I'll, I'll, I'll wait. To, it's the team coming out of the Midwest. Um, that is not. Uh, uh, all right. Thank you for joining me, Matt. Now let's uh, talk to your partner in crime. We have to finish one region up here. Talk about the Midwest with Kai. All right. Joining me now to talk the Midwest region, our fourth and final region of our first round preview. Keeping my big bets on campus live every day of the term this upcoming weekend, 10 30 a.m. Eastern on Twitter. It's Kai McEwen, the three man weave. Kai, how goes it? Where are the excitement levels? Uh, we are recording this on Tuesday night. We are, what, 30 something, low 30 hours um, before Christmas. We are indeed. And we just had our first game of the tournament with Texas AM Corpus Christi and Texas Southern. I was on the Islanders. It was not a good result. What an awful final seven and eight minutes, by the way. Unbelievable. The free throw shooting splits were. Uh, eye popping for two teams that should have shot the opposite. Yeah, Texas Southern, not a good free throw shooting team. Feels like whatever game the SWAC team is in in that first four is always ugly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ugly game to watch at times. So we're going to have much prettier viewing uh, pleasure throughout the rest of the tournament than that one. It only gets better from here. So let's uh, dive right in and talk the Midwest region. Kansas, the number one overall seed, will be at Fort Worth. Auburn, the number two seed. Unfortunately for Auburn fans, they will not be playing at Auburn. Curious to get your thoughts on that. They'll be playing in Greenville. Uh, the three seed in th this region, Wisconsin. The four seed, Providence. I, that, when I first saw that, I was like, wow. That's, uh, mm -hmm. Auburn has been great away from home. Wisconsin, definitely overseeded. Uh, Providence, definitely overseeded. I was like, this is a, uh, a weak top of the bracket. Um, from a seating perspective was my first thoughts right when they released it. So I uh, actually think, and then look, then you got like LSU's the six seed offensive mm -hmm. problems. They just fired their coach. Um, yeah, there's a lot. Creighton just lost their point guard. And, you know, you have uh, Iowa state's offense is just in the dumpster. Um, there's uh, <laughs> a lot of teams that have just like, didn't that I kind of wanted to fade potentially. They're all like in the same exact region. What were your thoughts overall in this bracket? First came out for the Midwest. Yeah, well, I assume Bill Self is going to send the committee a love letter or, or a care package of some sort because what a draw that they got. Yeah. You mentioned the, the teams at the bottom of the bracket. Heck, the teams at the top of the bracket, I'm not too scared of either. I think Kansas kind of uh, cakewalks to the final four here, or at least it sets up that way on paper. Yeah, it's the one team that I'm super high on and history is way against me here is Iowa. I took a future mm -hmm. on Iowa about 50, 70 and 50 to one and sub 60 to one two weeks ago. I was like, this team's trending up. I'm actually a believer in them in Keegan Murray, mm -hmm. but that has proven to be a, not a good plan in the past to trust Iowa in the NCAA tournament. Uh, I take it. You're not as fond of the Hawks as I am. Yeah. Uh, Fran McCaffrey never made a sweet 16. Um, but you know, the old adage of, of coaches, uh, you could go on and on about uh, coaches who were doubted 
winning in the tournament, small sample yeah. size. I mean, Jay Wright. Tony they, Bennett, Jay yeah, Wright. Uh, Jay Wright. They, they never thought he'd win a tournament game and he wins two titles in a row. You know, I mean, they're basically in a row. Uh, so, yeah, Frank could do it. And this Iowa team is different, right? It, it, it feels different. They play a little bit better defense. Their offense is ridiculous. Um, I believe in them a little bit more than I usually do. I'll put it that way. Scott Drew, remember Peace, they just get hate all the time. Too. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the narratives can change quickly. It's a one and done tournament. You need some some luck on your side. But uh, yeah, we'll get to Iowa. We'll talk about potential landmines for them. But let's start uh, up top. Let's dive in here. Kansas uh, taking on Texas Southern. Who cares? Don't care. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, you do you want to offer any thoughts here or same? Should we move on? No, not too many thoughts right now. Um, we'll see what the line is, but probably Kansas. San Diego State, the eight seed taking on Creighton, the nine. I really love San Diego State here. Um, yes. This game should be a war, but I think that the loss of Creighton's point guard will catch up to them here. I, you know, San Diego State can really force turnovers. They're not going to give up anything at the rim. And I think the main difference, it's, like, it's not like San Diego State's going to have a uh, – just a – an open door to offense here. They can mm-hmm. struggle offensively at times, but I think the difference, you know, if it's close late or just key shots throughout Matty Bradley. Um, oh yeah. I think he will be the difference. What are your thoughts there? Yeah. He's a gamer. I mean, Trey Pulliam, the guy can play too. Let's stop forget yep. about him. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's he's looked better State's offensively game. late yes. in the season. He has. They've gotten a little bit better, but yeah, it's a defensive game. Both ends. Creighton's pretty good at defense too, but San Diego State, they're on their, another level defensively. Second best team in the country on defense per Ken Pum. Uh, the key here, I, I agree, Ryan Nemhard, he hasn't been a huge deal for them being out of lineup, but they haven't played anybody that really forces turnovers and or can stop the paint, and San Diego State can do both. Um, I think they are in big trouble. Kalkbrenner, not going to have his usual advantage here against Mensa, who is probably the best defender in the Mountain West in the interior. Um, I, I think this sets up great for San Diego State. And there's one team I'm worried about, for Kansas's run, it's kind of San Diego State because they play yep. such good defense. I think defense really goes far in the tournament. Yeah, higher variance game because San Diego State mm-hmm. will cr- crawl that as well. Um, yeah, sit. I mean, I was like way down on Creighton, ready to fade them into oblivion. I even faded mm-hmm. them against after they lost Nemar. I faded them against Seton Hall. Seton Hall was under the third point guard and won. And then they looked better in the in the biggest tournament. To your point. They played Marquette, a team that can pressure you and turn you over, and they did turn it over 25%, but Marquette couldn't stop them inside. Mm-hmm. Um, here's the thing. San Diego State can pressure you into turnovers, and you can't get anything at the rim on them. No. Um, so I think that the loss of the point guard, uh, Bradley's going to get his, um, and uh, I think that's ultimately the difference. Yeah, San Diego State, I don't know if they have enough offense. Now, if Bradley's just cooking mm-hmm. and you know he has one of his nights where he's making everything under the sun – that's that's an eight nine that I could get behind more so than like Seton Hall T, winner of Seton Hall TCU versus Arizona. Right. Um, so yeah, I think Kansas prevails, but San Diego State will not be comfortable, and that game won't be like Kansas by eighteen. Um, yeah, so, definitely. Uh, I agree there. So we have San Diego State. It's one of my favorite bets of the first round in the Midwest. Let's move on to the bottom half of that top pot in the Midwest. Iowa taking on Richmond. Iowa ten and a half point favorite here uh, against Richmond. The, the Spiders, who came out of the eight ten four games in four days, really talented offensive team. Run a lot of backdoor stuff. Had some good shooters. Tyler Burton, the potential pro. Um, I don't know if they have anyone that can cover Keegan Murray, but I don't know if anyone really mm-hmm. does. Are you worried about the legs here for Richmond after four and four, like emotional win? Like, do they just yeah. it's like oh, you come out a little flat? Um, but, you know, Iowa's defense been better of late. And they've been mm-hmm. turning teams over. Richmond won't turn the ball over. I can see paths to offenses here for both teams. Um, so, you know, maybe this is a, a shootout where Iowa could find themselves in trouble. Iowa also, you know, I said the, the potential legs. Like, as Iowa, they won the Big Ten tournament. Nice mm-hmm. run. Saw that with Illinois last year, right? And then they come out and they kind of – True lay a little bit of an egg is, is richmond live here do you like them catching double digits man they, they could they could be yeah, yeah. It, it's a high spread i think double digits is too much i like the over because to your point the efficiency on both sides should be out the out the wazoo uh richmond's princeton offense um could be a problem for iowa they're not the best defensive team they've gotten better but they still have their awards 
Um, I think Grant Golden is going to be a bit of a challenge uh, for, for Robracha if he's playing the five to step out on him on the perimeter. I love Gilliard and experienced guards in general in March. He's very poised. I don't think I was going to bother them at all with turnovers. On the other end, you're absolutely right. No one is guarding Keegan Murray. I, Richmond is not good defensively to begin with, but especially against a guy like Keegan Murray, it's a huge problem for them. Uh, so basically, the R- Richmond just has to score enough to keep it within 10. I think they can. I like the over here, I like the Spiders. Yeah, uh, let's see. Keegan Murray over his last 13 games. Uh, he is averaging 26 points per game, 56% from the field, 49% from three. I mean, he's he might be uh, the favorite now for player of the year, right, over Shibuya. They, they, yeah, there's talks of it. Be. And uh, the emergence of his brother, Chris, <laughs> has been one of the keys to their resurgence. Um, I think he's been huge because Keegan has – Always going to get his, but uh, his kind of uh, his play late in the season, I think, is uh, a big difference maker for Iowa. But yeah, I can see Richmond having success here, obviously, and I, see, I can see this turning into a shootout. So yep. I agree. Then here's here's a polarizing one. This is the one. Four thirteen. <laughs> Providence versus South Dakota State. I had a tweet. I don't know what, if this is fade or not. On February twenty second, I said when everyone was just hating Providence, and I was and like it was just. And I was too. I was writing stuff about how lucky they were. I was like, man, this has gone too far. I was like, what's going to happen is uh, Providence is, I said, Providence is going to open up uh, as a one point favorite or underdog against South Dakota State. Somehow I nailed the matchup and they're going to win by 45. (laughs) Uh, Now, obviously, I'm just being uh, using hyperbole on Twitter, but um, wow, it's kind of bizarre that I tweeted that out. I'm leaning Providence here, and I wanted to bet South Dakota State incredible offense. Mm-hmm. This game's in Buffalo. Maybe Providence will have a, a little bit more of a contingent here, but I don't know who's covering Nate Watson. You know, Yemen right. Naya, who can cover Shireman, who has you know, struggled a little bit with really athletic, long defenders this year. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if South Dakota State just keeps shooting 45% from three. They're the highest yeah. three-point percentage, single-season percentage since uh, Northern Colorado in 2012. Wow. And if it's a close game late, Providence is going to find a way to win. That is uh, yeah. what they've done all year, and that will work here. I don't, I, I, but I can tell you, look, I don't even feel comfortable that spreads two, two and a half. I don't even feel comfortable laying two and a half. So I'm, I'm going to be on Providence Bunny <laughs> line. Um, I think you like the Jack Bunnies here. Um, I do. So maybe they can, if they lose by one, we're both happy. But, uh, Tell me why this incredible South Dakota State offense, very vulnerable defense, um, yeah. but just an incredible shooting team, why they're going to advance. Yeah, well, and talk about unprecedents in this pod here. South Dakota State's never made it out of the first round. They've only been in D1 since like 2006. But they've lost in the first round every single year. I think they can do it here. Um, obviously, you're going to have narratives on both sides. You said it's polarizing. If Providence wins, you're going to get all the Providence backers touting how mm-hmm. – stupid this line was and South Dakota state wins. Everyone's going to say, I told you so. Providence was so lucky. Always overrated. <laughs> I, I, I like South Dakota state because of the shooting. I think it's real. There's five guys that can shoot on the floor at all times. And all of them shoot over like 40%. It, it's nuts with the exception of Douglas Wilson, more of an inside guy. He can get in foul trouble. I'm worried about that. I think Nate Watson is going to get him out of the game pretty quick, but South Dakota state has other guys. They're not going to stop him. Would you believe they're the best defensive team in the summit? Cause that they are but they still allow over like 1.01 points per possession. It's not a good defensive team at all. Um, it's just kind of like Iowa Richmond. I think it's going to be a lot of efficiency in this game. You're right. Jared Bynum is a killer in late game situations. Providence. I don't really want to fade them in a close so game. Is Durham. Durham is so clutch. And he's like, yeah, this is a free throw. Late. It's ridiculous. Uh, but I'm going with South Dakota state. I got to stick to my guns here. I kind of wanted this matchup as well during the season. Someone put my money where my mouth, my, where my mouth is. Fair enough. Uh, South in your bracket. Do you have South Dakota State yeah. beating I, Iowa or Richmond? Do no. You have Richmond? Do you have complete chaos here? I took Iowa. I took Iowa Sweet 16. I'm, I'm going with Fran here. All right. Love to hear it. Uh, all right, let's go to the bottom half of the Midwest. Uh, we'll start with uh, – well, Auburn is the two seed down here, and Wisconsin is the three seed. Really interesting game one, or I should say round one matchup, 6-11 between two power conference teams, mm-hmm. LSU and Iowa State. Two teams that can really struggle in the half court offensively. Iowa State even more so than LSU. They put up a couple stinkers down there. 36 points and 44. 
these two teams cause a lot of turnovers. They will turn it over a lot themselves. You have the LSU. We don't have a coach angle now uh, with mm-hmm. Will Wade getting canned. How does that affect things? Um, LSU a four point favorite here over under sitting around one twenty seven. And then you got Wisconsin Colgate next, which we'll talk about. It's like I, I don't know who's coming out of this for. Um, yeah, it's tough to choose. But uh, what do you got in the first game? LSU versus Iowa State. Then Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin, obviously a big yeah. Uh, what advantage here. Uh, I think the spread's a little high. I like Iowa State plus four. I like the under as well. To your point, uh, it's going to be ugly. Both teams are top six in turnover rate in the country defensively, and both teams turn the ball over. So I think you're going to get a lot of turnovers. It's going to be a pain to watch. Neither team really good offensively either. Um, Can't really shoot. Both teams really stop the ball inside. Uh, Iowa State's not athletic or not more athletic than, than LSU. They're certainly the underdogs in that sense, but they play really hard. I and mean, they yep. scrap, and that's hard to measure. But you watch that team play. They're well coached. T.J. Altselberger, major advantage here against Nickelberry from a, a coaching perspective and X's and O's. I think that actually matters a bit here. So I like the clones. I took them to advance my bracket, too. You're going to need a big – they, their offense goes as – I mean, look, their offense goes as Isaiah Brockman goes. If he has yep. a big day um, yep. and is hitting shots, then uh, they'll be okay. If he's off, then it's trouble. Um, the one thing I'm worried about is, like, a lot of fouls. I'm worried about the tra- teams getting mm-hmm. the teams getting it on transition because they can't, they're not going to be able to score in much of the half court. Right. Uh, and because both teams turn you over and both teams turn it over, that might keep me off the under. But when I first saw this matchup and looked at this game, I was like, this is under. I mean, I, they're, Iowa State could score 41 points. Iowa right. State <laughs> score 45. Like it could get really ugly, um, especially if they're not calling it tight. Um, mm-hmm. So I would agree. Um, LSU, by the way, I think they co- they they won a game without a coach before, without Will Wade before, right? In the first, they did. Time. I think they won. I think they made the Sweet Sixteen, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So they it's been done. Yeah. There's precedence. Yeah. Their assistant, he came from uh, Nickelberry. He was on the head coach Howard. Yeah, Howard, and he coached Hampton too. He did not do well at either school. So this guy, kind of, yeah. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to say. I think Will Wade has done a good job defensively like with LSU will mix it up like they're gonna I bet you they, they, they'll use zone they'll press oh, so yeah. they can have some success against Iowa State because you can zone Iowa State but like does okay when do we do what is there continuity mm-hmm. issues that could pop up here yep. with the, with seemingly a drop off uh from the head coach to the assistant coach and who knows if is it a rallying point or are they distracted by all this you don't know um yeah how can they play. yeah the distraction how can they not be right uh, yeah man um okay don't hate that um but the problem is like i don't i don't know if i tr- like if you advance i would say i trust them enough to move them to the sweet 16 no <laughs> but then do you go with wisconsin to the sweet 16 because i think wisconsin is vulnerable even though they're yeah. playing Milwaukee against colgate uh they are seven and a half eight point favorite and i, I think this is a decent matchup for colgate colgate incredible mm. shooters across the board i mean jack ferguson they all can shoot it go look i mean they got a kid yeah. from Forget where he transferred from. Uh, Houston Baptist. After. Yeah, he's shooting yeah. like 50%. I mean, everyone yeah. can shoot in this team. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, records is their big. It's like a four out around him. He's we're very underrated around the rim. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're not going to get overwhelmed athletically here. And I think that one of the keys is that um, Johnny Davis, one of the best players in the country, who would be a matchup edge for Wisconsin here, is um, um, potentially not fully healthy. Maybe he is, but it can yeah. only work in Colgate's favor if he's not. Um, so this game's in Milwaukee, but – you have a home edge here, but that could end up working against them. Like with all the nerves, you're going to have all these other fans that are drunk yep. at, at night in Milwaukee. They're going to start rooting for Colgate. Um, Colgate, you know, it's, it, I, I think that they can shoot well enough here against the Wisconsin team. It's a way overseeded in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, got very lucky all year and uh, they can hang athletically. That's the key. I actually, I got a little crazy. I have Colgate going to the sweet 16. I like them 12 to one also. You could find out there to go to the Sweet 16, especially given some of like the vulnerability of LSU and Iowa State. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, like I said, Wisconsin's overseeded. What do you see with Wisconsin Colgate? And then who do you have going to your Sweet 16 out of this little pot of chaos? Yeah. <laughs> Yo, yeah. Same reason I like South Dakota State. Colgate can shoot. You said it. They, every single player on this team can shoot. I like the fact that they're not facing an athletic team. I think we mentioned that today on our show. Wisconsin's not going to overwhelm them. That's kind of Colgate's weakness. Colgate's also been here before. There's guys in this team that have been to the tournament twice for Colgate. They were up on Arkansas last year. They hung tight with Tennessee two years ago. They're not going to be intimidated by this game. 
It's not, it's not a, a, a little, it's not, it's not a men's versus boys type of game. This one, it's more so equally matched, I think between these two teams, so I think seven yeah, and a half. They came back big. against Tennessee. Uh, yeah. They were tied in both games at 10 to go. They were down 12 at that. And they had, they lost their best player, arguably the best player yeah. or one of them, I should say, Zad Burns at the, at, in the first half to an eye injury. He didn't play in the yeah. second half. So this is a team with a lot of turning experience, a lot of experience overall. And as you said, everyone can shoot it. They're second in the nation. Mm-hmm. In three point percentage, South Dakota State, as you mentioned, is number one. They're the only teams over forty, I believe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, so I think there's value on them. It's going to be really funny to watch, man, because it's in Milwaukee, like you said. It's the last game of the night. You know, the beer's going to be flowing. Wisconsin fans are going are going to go crazy here. Uh, I, I'm taking Colgate here. Uh, I'm not as worried about Wisconsin kind of seizing up. They do have really experienced guards, Brad Davison. To hate him or love him, I mean, he is a poised player in, in crunch time. Yep. And the Davis question is a good one. He played 34 minutes last game, but three for 19 from the floor, maybe hobble, maybe he's playing hurt, had a couple of days off. I tend to think he's fine, but still like Colgate here. Yeah, it's only something, but even if you think he's fine, it's only something that could work in Colgate's favor if you're right. Him, right. Right. Um, he can't be healthier than healthy. So if it's healthy, I still think right. Colgate has a shot, but if he's not, uh, this is a major upset alert because Wisconsin without a healthy Davis is uh, not great. Um right. All right, let's move on to – well, who did you have gone to the Sweet 16 then? I'm, Wisconsin. Iowa State? I'm, I'm defaulting to Wisconsin. Um, okay. I don't love it. Don't love any team here. Um, but default into the – If you don't love any team, default yeah. into the favorite is, is the smart move. Yeah. Um, and then pick your battles elsewhere in the bracket. Let's move to the bottom pod, the final four teams of the Midwest. USC taking on Miami. Really interesting game here. Um one coach who's had a lot of success against the spread in the tournament, one really excellent prep coach in Laranega. Um, how do you see USC Miami playing out? Basically, a game that's basically around a pick them one point spread. Yeah, USC is one of my favorite bets of the first round. Um, that size edge is massive. I, and they have big guards, USC. Drew Peterson, 6'9 guard. Miami, really, really rim attack focused. You can't really do that against USC's interior. I think USC's backcourt can even slow down their guards uh, on the penetration. Isaiah Mobley is a tough matchup for Miami. Miami's defense is the worst in the Laranega era. Um, so even though USC is not a great offensive team, I think they find ways to score here. So I really like USC. I need to just bottle up Miami on, on the defensive end. One of the things that I would be worried about with USC is, you know, USC is a, you know, they're, they're I, th- I would say I would take their defense over their offense. They're not going to like bury a team, generally no. speaking. And, you know, craziness ensues in the tournament. And Miami's had some crazy finishes. And <laughs> if Miami's down like, you know, four to six late and uh, they start fouling um, or just throughout the game, USC free throws are a problem yep. um, in, a, in a game, you know, in a, in a tournament setting. It might, I don't know if it bites them this round, but that is uh, a major issue for the Trojans. I'm still undecided on that one. Um, <clears throat> but it's good to hear that you love it. That'll factor in to my process. Uh, the winner of that game, who you think is USC, will take on the winner of Auburn, Jacksonville State. If you want to get crazy, <laughs> uh, I would look at Jacksonville State as a, you, like I'm talking extremely crazy. Like you just want to have a bracket. Right. For chaos. Just because I think this game will have a ton of three-point variants, Jacksonville State's going to – it's their only course of offense here. They have four guys who can really shoot the lights out of the ball. Um, and then they will – they're very packed in. So they're going to get a lot of defensive rebounds, which is important against Auburn. And they're going to they, – but they give up a ton of threes. So if they're, if they're falling for Auburn, good night. The, Auburn wins this game by 30. Uh, but if Auburn's chucking up a lot of bad shots and Jacksonville State, as their guards do, and it's not a great three-point shooting team. And Jacksonville State, who I think pretty convinced they're going to slow this game down to a crawl. Or walk the ball at the court, which is weird because I'm, and I go back and forth this because if Auburn speeds this game up, there's just turnover issues for Jacksonville State. Maybe Jacksonville State, like they got out, they get out of the A Sun and they have a lot of like athletes and they're actually in the 99th percentile in transition offense. Yeah. But uh, they play, play slow and I think you want to slow this one up. It's going back and forth on that one. But I think there'll be a ton of threes in this game. Um, and Auburn hasn't been great. Their guards just play erratic away from home. At home, they're an absolute monster, but this isn't on the road. Um, and Auburn, obviously, it, probably the best rim defense in the country. Mm-hmm. A lot of talent, just erratic guards. You have a first-round draft pick. You have Walker Kessler defending the rim. 
Uh, Jacksonville State didn't win their conference or didn't get their conference title in there here as the right. uh, automatic entry. Poor Bellarmine. Um, <laughs> what do you see in this one? Auburn 16 point favorite ish. Well, that's kind of what I like your narrative of Jacksonville State wins. All the talk of they didn't even win their conference tournament. They shouldn't even be yeah. here. And lo and House behold, money, they, baby. <laughs> yeah. Second round. Uh, uh, this is the best chance you have at a 15 seat upset, in my opinion, just based on how yeah. the twos and 15 stacked out. Because your point, Jacksonville State's going to dare Auburn to shoot threes, and you can bet Wendell Green, Katie Johnson, they're going to oblige. They're going to jack up so many shots. And if they're off like they were against Texas A&M, yeah, Jacksonville State's going to hang tight. And they also have in, this, in the middle Brandon Huffman, a former UNC North player. North Carolina. Yeah, yeah he, he's big. He's not going to score a bunch, but he can maybe slow Kessler down a little bit. He can maybe be a force inside, maybe keep Auburn off the glass somewhat. There's no matchup for Jabari Smith, but again – that erratic guard play in your right, uh, again, a, uh, a low possession game. I think Jacksonville State's really going to try to uh, slow it down here. 15 and a half is a lot of points. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm looking at Jacksonville State there as well. Um, we have nine 15 seeds have won in mm-hmm. the NCAA tournament. Uh, doesn't happen often, but I think this is the one that you would want. It's happened twice. In the last five or six turns, we saw it. Middle Tennessee beat Michigan State. Oral Roberts mm-hmm. last year beat Ohio State. Um, but yeah, they're going to play a three twos. They're going to play their three twos and they're going to pack it all the way in. So, I mean, Smith, they have no matchup for him, but they're going to make yeah. him shoot jumpers, um, you crash the defensive glass, and walk it up the court, shoot three themselves. If Auburn's off, this one could get interesting. All right, bottom half, you have Wisconsin reluctantly going through, and then like we're you know, we're saying Auburn might be in trouble. I mean, who do you have coming out of here to go to the Elite Eight from the bottom half? Again, I defaulted to the high seed. I defaulted to Auburn because they're, they're good is, is among the best in the country. Yeah. If they're on, they can win the national title. So I'm kind of hoping they start to swing back towards that. Got a coach in Bruce Pearl who we didn't even mention. He's been to the Final Four before. Um, he, he, he has what it takes. He knows what it takes to make it that far. So I did take Auburn out of that bottom region, the bottom part of the region. I uh, got Kansas going to the final four though. Yeah. I think the two hardest elite eight selections are from that. So you might just want to default to the favor. And then the, uh, on the West, the, you know, Alabama, yeah. Texas tech Duke. Um, there's some landmines there. You, you know, Rutgers, if they get like Alabama is just that high variance team, if they're hitting threes yep. and they can shoot against Texas tech, Texas tech's probably the, the biggest, uh, the steadiest team. Duke's the most talented. They have defensive issues, but I mean, a team like Alabama, Texas tech doesn't want to see them. Now, yeah. Alabama misses every three, but they, they're going to make you shoot threes, and Alabama's going to shoot a million threes, and if they were in, they could beat Texas Tech. Uh, the problem is, Alabama could lose the Rutgers. I mean, I, I, that was a difficult one for me to pick the Elite Eight, as well mm-hmm. as Auburn. So it might be smartest just to um, go with the chalk, and uh, unless you want to get crazy and pick Jacksonville State over Auburn. Um, but I think that's the highest variance two versus 15 game, which is if you want to pick one of these two versus 15s, they happen like once every couple of years. Um, I think that's the one to target. All right, um, so I, spoiler, I have Iowa coming out of this. And a lot of it's, I have two features. I have Kentucky and I have Iowa, and I just stick with them. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, Unless, you know, so I'm sticking with my futures. I think Iowa, Kansas would be an incredible game. Um, And I think that uh, it can go either way. I think, honestly, that game would be like Kansas minus two um, as of right now. And uh, Iowa have a good shot to win it. Hopefully, Iowa doesn't disappoint me before then. But I have Iowa coming out, going to the Final Four, and um, I have them taking on Arizona. Um, Maybe I'll get crazy and put them in the final. I have Kentucky winning all Uh. season. It doesn't (laughs) matter. But uh, I still haven't penciled in my other favorite yet. But I just – why not have both your futures meet in the title and then win a bracket pool if it's Iowa versus Kentucky? Yeah. Um, Why not just go for it all? (laughs) Uh, No diversification whatsoever. So we'll see. Uh, How about you? Final Four? Title matchup and champion. Yeah, I like the Wayne's World mega happy ending. You got there, the Iowa Kentucky yeah. future there. Uh, I I went pretty pretty chalky, I would say, and that's kind of usually my 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 forte. I, I I've done upsets in the past, hasn't worked out for me. Got too too cute with stuff, but I got Kansas over Auburn in the Midwest. I, I think their path is just too good to pass up. K, KU uh, from the South, I actually have Villanova. Um, I have them beating Houston, so I did take Houston over Arizona. Um, I, I'm a big believer in the Cougars, very underseated compared to analytics. Got Gonzaga coming out of the West over Texas Tech. 
Uh, and I got Kentucky coming out of the East over Baylor. I uh, got Gonzaga over Kansas in the finals. Mark Few cutting down the nets. Love it. Uh, yeah, I went with uh, my strategy, my bracket. I kind of do the same thing every year. Obviously, it's futures influence because I mean, I, I also believe in those teams, generally speaking, compared to the market. But I have like, I, usually, I like to have like two ones to do here in Arizona and Gonzaga, mm-hmm. a two or a three, and then like a four or five um, yeah. that comes from a weaker region. Um, so I would fit that mold because I have a future on them. I believe in them. And I think the Midwest is, uh, is the most vulnerable yeah. region from, uh, you know, one through five or six um, with, a, and I was included in that, but the other teams in the one through six. Uh, so I will die with there, but uh, like your final four, I wish you luck, my friend. Thanks for all the insight. Uh, again, you can catch us. Well, thanks. Uh, also, to Matt Cox for joining me to talk the East Bracket. Both of our college basketball NCAA tournament round one previews, part one and two, are both out now. Big bets on campus, wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe. Hope you enjoyed the content. Hopefully it helps you with your bracket and find some winners. Enjoy the madness. And we will see you 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Big bets on campus live every day of the tournament this weekend. Uh, Myself and the guys from Three Men Weave including Kai, to try and help you guide you through the cards each day. So thanks for listening again. Good luck. Enjoy the madness. Christmas is almost here. We'll see you over the weekend. Cheers.